What is ocean acidification? Is it increasing and how will we be affected by it? CO2 that we emit to the atmosphere, about one third or one fourth of it dissolves in the ocean. And this was initially looked at as good news because there's less up there and therefore we have less warming to expect for us. However, all that CO2 is now in the ocean and nobody initially thought this could do anything there. Well, the CO2 reacts in the ocean, forming carbonic acid and a bunch of other chemical reactions, and it ends up making the ocean more acidic. Now, the ocean water is not neutral water like fresh water. It's somewhat basic. It has a high pH. I, I guess I won't get into a whole thing about pH, but let's just say now the ocean is more acidic because of all the, the CO2 that's coming into it. And then the question is, so what? And the changed chemistry affects organisms that live there. Some of the organisms that are affected the most are organisms that build shells out of calcium carbonate. So corals are included there. Um, Mollusks like snails and oysters and clams and mussels are included there. Uh, tiny plankton uh, called forams are included there. There's a lot of, of marine animals that make shells out of calcium carbonate. And the formation of the shell is slowed down and impeded by this excess CO2 lower, uh, uh, increased acidity in the water. And uh, this came to light, I mean, people knew it theoretically, and, but they all thought, well, this is a future thing. But uh, about 10 years ago, uh, a uh, oyster farm in uh, Oregon was experiencing problems in the water. They were getting water from deeper water pumping up for their aquaculture facility. And uh, the baby oysters that are, the baby oysters swim around, they're tiny plankton, and then they have to make a shell and they have to attach, go down to the bottom and attach to grow up to be a regular oyster. And the process of forming shells was not happening, right? And they had a big failure for a couple of years they brought in some scientists to figure out what the problem was. And the problem was that the water they were bringing in was too acidic. So um, there are other things that have been noticed. There are tiny snails that are part of the plankton. They're, they're tiny snails, and they have thin shells to begin with, and they're noticing uh, that their shells are now showing signs of pockmarks and, and being eroded away. So it's beginning to happen in certain animals. Uh, there's some observations in corals as well being affected in terms of shell formation. So that's the one that's gotten the most attention. There's other work that's been, do been done finding behavioral differences in a lot of different animals, in fishes, and crabs, so forth, so uh, not just um, mollusks and shell, shelled animals. Um, the behavior that depends on the sense of smell is impaired. And for a lot of those animals, this is, there's a lot of important behaviors that depend on the sense of smell. Uh, detecting pr your food, detecting prey for many animals depends on odor. Detecting that there's predators coming around for, for a smaller organism, also depends on the sense of smell. If you don't detect the predator there, you won't run away, which is the best thing to do, or hide or something. So um, that kind of behavior is impaired. Homing behavior and migration behavior is also very dependent on the sense of smell. And this is also impaired. So though up till now there has been more attention and, and 
and work and scientists looking at the issue of shell formation, I, I think in the end, the behavior changes, since it affects almost everything in the ocean, will have more profound effects in the long run than the shell formation. The shell formation problems will affect us directly if you like shellfish, if, if, you, like, if you like them to eat or you like them to see them and watch them and so forth. Uh, and, and shellfish play important roles in the ecology of the marine environment. Is, censor is censorship in America the exclusive purview of conservatives and corporations? Uh. <laughs> go, to, go to any campus in America and look at the, this, this, this rampant censorship going on in the name of inclusion. You know, I rest my case, it's disgraceful. Yeah, I would, I would say that censorship is, a, is a, a tool of power, and whoever holds power will have an interest in silencing dissent and silencing questioning, silencing objections. And so in, in, in places where the left has power, the left is fully capable of engaging in censorship, and in places where the right has power, the right is fully capable of engaging in censorship. Um, and so I don't think it's a left-right. Um, you know, and actually, weirdly, this strikes me. Here's the silver lining of censorship, right? Um, is that it, it's not a partisan issue, right? I think it's a First Amendment issue. I think it's a human rights issue, free speech. Um, and so it's, it's the kind of an issue, weirdly, um, that, it, that in principle, it seems like across the political spectrum, everyone should be able to get behind. But in fact, what happens is, because of polarization, we end up with maybe this thin middle being the only people who are passionate about protecting um, uh, free speech, while from the left and the right, um, we just see greater and greater amounts of, of silencing, intimidation, um, censorship going on. So it's a, uh, you know, in principle, it seems like it's a problem that we ought to be able to rally around in practice. We seem to be failing. Uh, I want to say another thing about this. Um, I think that we misunderstand what's going on on campus especially. The despotic behavior that we're seeing among the academic intellectual class uh, is really not about what it seems to be about. It's not about justice. It's not really about inclusion, and it's not about diversity. It's about the pleasure of coercion. It's about the pleasure of pushing people around. And that's what it's really about. And, and we gotta get serious and real about it, and not pretend. What has been the result of increasing demand for seafood worldwide, and also, um, does aquaculture, the raising of marine organisms for food, negatively impact the oceans and lakes where they are grown? So the results of increasing demand for seafood worldwide is first part, the second part, does aquaculture, the raising of marine organisms for food, negatively impact the oceans and lakes where they are grown? Obviously, you take more fish and other living things out of the ocean at a rate beyond which their reproduction, beyond their reproductive rate, their populations go down. If you could get the right number to take out for, for people, you can get a balance and get a sust what they call a sustainable yield. If you get the right number, you could take out a certain amount this year and still have the same amount available to take out next year and in perpetuity. But finding that number is very difficult and there's political arguments between the fishing industry and conservationists over where the number should be. The, the calculations to come up with the number are based on models. The models usually consider only the particular species that you're talking about. And don't consider the fact that this particular species you're looking at interacts with other species. 
and they have things that eat it, and there's things that it eats. And all of this is critical to coming up with the right number. And those ecosystem-based fishery management should be the goal, and a lot of, there's a lot of good words about it, but we don't really see it happening. People haven't figured out quite how to do it right. How, uh, going on about the aquaculture, the future of getting seafood is aquaculture. We are depleting the standard fishery uh, management is depleting many, many populations in the ocean. Um, and if you grow them, it's like the difference between hunter-gatherer hunter societies and agriculture. Agriculture, we know, has done a lot to feed people, but has also caused environmental problems, depending on how you do it. And it's the same thing with aquaculture. It can feed a lot of people, it can do a lot of good, but it depends on how you do it. And uh, there, unfortunately, has been some aquaculture that has gone the same way as the big agriculture in terms of using lots of chemicals. And this is not good. But, um, and, and also in terms of what are you going to feed the fish that you're raising. You're going to catch other fish out of the ocean to feed the fish that you're feeding if you're growing, let's say, salmon, a big, bigger predatory fish. And so the fish you're taking out would have otherwise fed fish in the ocean, but now they're feeding the fish in your aquaculture system. So the best kind of aquaculture, I think, is for shellfish. Shellfish, like oysters and clams and mussels, um, they are filter feeders. You don't have, you get them in good water with plankton, they're going to eat the plankton out of the water. You don't have to feed them with anything. You don't have to use chemicals. Sea, the sea, shellfish and seaweed are the best kind of aquaculture in terms of having the least negative impacts on the environment and also in having some benefits, actually. So. I wonder if I could, um, I, I think we almost bumped into the elephant in the room there, right? And the elephant in the room is if we don't control the human population growth, it doesn't make a difference where we get our food, it doesn't make a difference whether we all drive a Prius. Um, there is no technological solution um, to our environmental and health problems if we don't gain control over the human population. There's a book several years ago um, by Dave Foreman called Man Swarm, and gosh, you know, there was this time where we talked about zero population growth. Um, and that, that has almost disappeared from the environmental discourse. Um, and Foreman suggests that it was this, uh, this strange collusion between the left and the right. From the left, we had this notion, well, wait a minute, who are we to tell the non-industrial world to have fewer babies, right? And from the right, it was, well, gosh, we've got to have more babies because we have to have more consumers because, gosh, we need economic growth. Um, and so it, the, the, the zero population sort of fell off the agenda through this weird, although from different directions, this weird collusion from the left and the right. And now we're talking lots and lots and lots about all kinds of clever technologies and, and ways to reduce climate change and how to grow food and whatnot. And damn it, I just don't hear a whole lot of talk about how we're gonna get control over the human population. I've got an idea. For every dollar that we put into GMOs, we put a dollar into zero population growth. For every dollar we put into solar energy, we put a dollar into zero population growth. If we match that dollar for dollar, our technology with, uh, against, and that's the consumption side, if we, if we match it against the human growth side, then we might be onto something. I think it is a truly dismaying scene that you're describing, and um, it's basically true that we've lost interest in, in this. But I also think there's a parallel truth that we just can't really deal with, and, and that is the, uh, the probable, probable fact that there's not going to be any policy, there's not going to be any protocol about reproduction. We're not going to do anything about it. Um, you know, we're, we're going to reach the limits of uh, population overshoot and then, uh, you know, the consequences of it will have 
its way with us. But this is related to an idea I introduced earlier before you arrived, which, you know, it, it's one of those sort of uh, conceits of the intellectual classes in America that, you know, if, if you can count enough things, you can control it. You know, if you can throw enough dollars at something, you can control it. This is something that is unlikely to be controlled by policy means. It's probably going to be controlled by the, the kind of forces that, that uh, for all time on the planet Earth have controlled populations. And that's going to be a scramble for the resources that support these populations. And it's going to be probably pretty ugly. Um, and uh, I don't think there's going to be a policy. So uh, let's not kid ourselves about it. I think it's very clear that in societies where women get rights and there's more equality there is in a society, the more options there are for women, the fewer children they have. And that's a way of reducing population growth without coercion. It's, it's the opposite. It's giving people, women, more rights. And that is a benefit for a lot of reasons, but also a benefit for reducing family size. Well, I'm going to agree to a large extent with you and suggest that the greatest moral challenge we face in the next 20 to 50 years is the just distribution of human suffering. That's a good way of putting it. Uh, yes, I think we can remember back to 1972 when there was a, a very important book came out called Limits to Growth where the Club of Rome did, did uh, this global dynamics. It was kind of crude modeling of what was happening to the world or what was going to happen to the world. But uh, it's still, it's actually stood the test of time. It's just that the, 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 the nasty things they <coughs> predicted took, took a greater amount of time to happen than they thought. But the, the limits to, one of the main things in the limits to growth was population. Uh, that we can't do anything really about everything else that's going wrong in the world as long as our population's growing in an unrestrained way. And um, the, the complacent view when that book came out was, um, was in fact, the editor of Nature went around making this point that there would be a demographic transition, that ev every third world nation would, would haul itself up by its own bootstraps and when it reached a certain level of uh, of affluence then the people wouldn't want to have lots of children because they need to have lots of children to look after them in old age so they would have fewer children uh, and so the world would correct itself and the trouble is that what actually happened is more nations fell into extreme poverty than rose out of it and uh, and then that so that demographic transition didn't happen except where it was in one or two countries like Singapore and, uh, or when it was forced like in China. So, um, but at least people were considering population as one of the biggest problems then uh, before they had to actually consider climate change. But that, that in, in 72, people had only just started to measure carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. <laughs> so people were kind of innocently thinking well, its population is the biggest problem, and pollution was <coughs> another thing that was reckoned to be about to lay us low, and nobody worries about pollution now, um, and nobody seems to worry about population, but it, <coughs> it hasn't stopped being the same threat that it was in 1972. So it is, it is very odd how people's attention does, has strayed from some of the important things that we should be concerning ourselves with. Mm -hmm.